Okay, I can't believe we finished a whole body system already, but we are moving on to the next one. So we're on to the muscular system, and here's an introduction, a general overview, as well as the functions of the muscular system. So let's get started. The muscular system is about 30 to 40% of your body mass. Okay. There are over 650 muscles, and that's just counting skeletal muscles, but we're going to learn about their other types of muscles as well. But you can see skeletal muscles allow for a wide range of movements and activities. Some functions, now these are just some, right? So some functions of the skeletal system. Movement, that's what everyone usually thinks of. So muscles pull on bones, that's true, and it allows us to move. But muscles also move our food and blood. That would be smooth muscles. Muscles give us some body shape, right? Otherwise, we'd just be skin on top of bones, which that's a little weird, right? Um, muscles give protection. Okay, it's another layer. Muscles uh, maintain our body temperature. Remember, one of the reasons uh, that we can maintain our body temperature is when we are cold, we can shiver, and that produces heat. So the action of muscles produces body heat. It helps us to maintain our posture and balance. Some of us have better posture and better balance than others. Uh, case in point, this image. It also guards our entrances and exits. So we can close our mouth, okay, to guard the entrance um, into our digestive system. We can, our eyes can blink, okay? Um, our anus guards um, the exit on that end muscles around the urethra, okay? So there are muscles that guard our entrances and exits. Also, it helps to stabilize our joints, okay? So that those bones are not flip-flopping and moving all around. Okay, in class, we're gonna watch this video. I'm not gonna show the video in this video. That would be a little weird. But if you uh, search for muscle bakes basics, um, I'll put a link in the description if you want to watch this video. There are two main categories of muscles. There's voluntary and involuntary. The voluntary muscles are the muscles that are under your conscious control. You decide, okay? So you can move your um, arm. So the muscles that are allowing that to happen, you can move your leg, you can turn your head, and you can also take a deep breath. So that weird shaped muscle you see right there, that's your diaphragm, okay? And then we have involuntary muscles, muscles that are not in your conscious control, the muscles that allow us um, to breathe, to digest our food and move it through the digestive tract, the muscles that um, are responsible for our bladder functioning, okay? our heart within the walls of our arteries. Okay? All kinds of muscles are involuntary. They're happening like behind the scenes, but they're allowing you to function as you are able, okay? So it's kind of like your hype squad behind the scenes crew, it lets you be you. All right, so there are three main types of muscles. So those are the categories of muscles, but now the types of muscles. We have skeletal, cardiac, and smooth, okay? The only ones that are voluntary in that group would be skeletal. So again, those are the muscles usually people think of when we think of the muscular system, They're the ones that attach to your bones. And then cardiac in the heart and smooth muscle in lots of other locations in our organs. Again, skeletal, voluntary, cardiac, and smooth, involuntary. Now, when we see lots of pictures of muscles, you almost always see this white tissue. Okay, so what is that white tissue? Well, it's connective tissue. In a lot of cases, it's a tendon, and that's what connects muscle to bone, okay? Sometimes it's kind of indistinct, okay? And in that case, it's called fascia. So it's in an indistinct type of connective tissue that might be surrounding um, muscles, okay? You might see that more when you're doing an actual dissection, as you can see, rather than in a, an illustration or skin. So let's get onto those muscle types. Skeletal muscle. Skeletal muscles attached to bones with tendons or that strong, tough connective tissue. Skeletal muscles, what produces heat? Remember, we shiver and that our skeletal muscles will move and produce some heat. Um, also, why you get warm when you're exercising. Okay. It's responsible for posture. It protects our internal organs. It's a layer of protection. And they're striated or stripes. And you can see from the histology slide 
you can see those striations or stress. And then we have cardiac muscle. Cardiac muscle is only in the heart. And something really important is it requires a constant supply of oxygen. Cardiac muscle cells will begin to die after 30 seconds without oxygen. And that's why heart attacks or myocardial infarctions are so dangerous. They cut off blood supply. The heart, tissue, heart tissue, heart cells start dying and that hurts. Okay. Cardiac muscle cells are also striated. Again, if you look at the histology slide, you can see those striations or strains. Smooth muscle is found in the walls of internal organs. There are no striations. So if you look here, I don't see any striations or stripes in that histology slide. Smooth muscle can contract for a long time, which is important if we're talking about it needs to happen for digestion, okay? It needs to happen for breathing, okay? It needs to happen for all of the things that are happening inside of our body that we don't have voluntary control over. Now, there are five rules for skeletal muscle activity. We're going to go over these rules sort of simplified one by one. But I'm just going to read through them to give you an overview. Number one, with a few exceptions, all skeletal muscles cross at least one joint. Number two, typically the bulk of a skeletal muscle lies proximal to the joint crossed. Three, all skeletal muscles have at least two attachments, the origin and the insertion. Four, skeletal muscles can only pull they never push. And five, during contraction, a skeletal muscle insertion moves toward the origin. Okay, I'm going to go through these step by step. And something to note, remember, you don't have to remember which rule is which. Like rule number two is, no, no. Just remember these are the five rules, okay? <clears throat> Okay, rule number one. Again, you do not have to remember this is rule one. This is the first one we're going to go over. With just a few exceptions, skeletal muscles cross at least one joint. As you can see in this picture, um, here is the biceps brachii muscle. Here is the joint at the elbow that the muscle is crossing. Okay, crosses a joint. Rule number two, most of the muscle lies proximal to the joint crossed. So here you can see this muscle highlighted in green. It crosses your elbow joint and you can see the bulk, the belly. This part of the muscle is proximal. So what's the difference? So here in my arm, okay, let's see. this. Okay, so here in my arm, proximal, closer to the attachment, distal, further away from the attachment to the trunk of the body, okay? So proximal, distal, okay? But if I look at my hand itself, this would be distal, this area right here would still be proximal, closer, okay? It doesn't have to be at the shoulder, it just has to be closer. So as I move from the shoulder out this way, I'm moving distally. And as I move from my fingertips back this way, I'm moving proximally. Okay, so that's just a reminder of those terms, okay? All right, um, so you can see, again, most of the muscle lies proximal to the joint crust. The third rule, it has at least two bone attachments. It's got to be attached to at least two bones, otherwise there's not going to be movement. Okay, if it's attached to the same bone, can't move anything that way. So the origin is the immovable bone and the insertion is the movable bone, okay? So you can see based on um, that animation that you see the bone, uh, the insertion bone is moving toward the origin bone. The insertion is the movable bone. So two bone attachments. So let's go back. So, so far we have cross at least a joint. Most of the muscle is proximal to the joint cross. There are two attachment points, at least. There can be more, but there are at least two attachment points, and those attachment points have names, origin and insertion. Let's go on to the next one. Muscles can only pull, they never push. Yes, you can do a push up, but that's because other muscles are pulling. Oh, crazy, right? But anyway, muscles can only pull, they never push. 
and rule five, which you already saw in that the same animation during a contraction, the insertion moves toward the origin. Okay, so overall, those are the five rules for skeletal muscles. So look at this image. Which muscle would shorten or contract to produce flexion of the elbow? You can see in the image, you can see what flexion is. So flexion is this. So what muscle would shorten to produce flexion? And they're both labeled. Well, which one is it? Do you have an idea? It would be the biceps brachii. That would be the one that would have to shorten to allow this to happen. <clears throat> so why do you think muscles appear to get bigger or bulge when they contract? Some people, show me your guns, right? Show me your muscles. Why is that? Do you have an idea? The muscle mass stays the same. So it's like your muscle's getting bigger when you flex. What's happening is they're staying the same size. The mass is the same, but the mass is just displaced. So instead of being long and thin, they're short and wide, and then the muscle up gives a larger appearance. So some muscle interactions. So we have the agonist and the antagonist. The agonist is also called the prime mover, and that's responsible for the movement. So the biceps, remember, did this. Okay. The antagonist is what's going to resist the movement of that prime mover. So we have the biceps going like this, but we have the triceps over here that are resisting that movement. That's the antagonist. So here again, you can see in this animation, the agonist, uh, when you are flexing, would be the biceps. The antagonist is the triceps. When you move your arm down, the reverse happens. Their roles switch. They swap. And there are two other interactions. We have synergist and fixator. Synergist is the helper. They help the prime mover. Okay, it also helps to prevent some of the rotation, but primarily the synergist helps the prime mover. The fixator is going to stabilize the origin. It fixes it, holds it in place, okay, keeps that origin steady. All right, so here are the four muscle interactions. So which one provides the major force for a movement? Do you know? The agonist. What muscles stabilize the origin, hold it in place? Do you know? Fixator. What muscles help the movement? Usually by adding force. So they're working together. It's like instead of one push a person pushing the car, three. Thinner discs, they're the helpers. And then what muscle resists the prime mover? Going against it. The antagonist. All right, something really fun and interesting, I always like to talk about this one, is the palmaris longus muscle. Okay, 10 to 16% of the population is born without this muscle. It actually varies around the world from a very low percentage to a very high, almost 70% percentage. So it may depend on your heritage. Uh, some people have it, so, so and some people don't. So here's how you test for it. Okay, so you're going to put your... Um, pinky and thumb, your little finger and your thumb together. Okay. I have to be able to see my wrist here. Okay. And then you're going to flex your wrist a little bit. And then you're going to look right here. See, I don't have it. Okay. Uh, you could see in the image right here when it's absent, nothing happens. So I'll try my other hand. So take pinky to thumb, flex your wrist a little bit, nothing. No tendon pops up here. Okay. So you can see right here that this muscle has a tendon and you will see this tendon in your wrist if you have it. It is possible to have it in one hand and not in the other, okay? So it is totally possible that you may have it in one and not the other. So what if it's missing? Oh my goodness, you had no idea you were missing this muscle. Guess what, no big deal. It has no effect on grip strength, it really has no effect. It's kind of like a spare tire. So that tendon is frequently used as a source for grafting material. So if you have a ruptured tendon, for example, that needs to be repaired. Um, that tendon is often um, harvested to use for that purpose. Okay, So if you don't have it, it's really not a big deal. Thank goodness, because I don't. And that's it. Muscular system introduction and uh, overview of functions, all kinds of things. Hopefully you learned something and stay tuned for the next one.